be ready. Uh, City Clerk, please call roll call. Council Member Story? Here. Council Member Peterson? Here. Council Member Brooks? Here. Council Member Botworth? Here. Mayor Bertrand? Here. Rise and say the <coughs> Pledge of Allegiance. Pledge of Allegiance. This flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. So for the public that's listening, this meeting is a cable cast live on Charter Communications Channel 8 and is being required to be broadcast on Wednesday at 8 p.m. 8 a.m. and on Saturday the following will be uh, 1 p.m. Uh, Charter Channel 71, Comcast 25 also. Meetings can also be viewed live from the city's website, uh, cityofcapitola.org. Our technician tonight is Lynn Dutton. As a reminder, please turn off your cell phones during this meeting and please sign your name when you come forth to speak. Um, I'd like to dedicate this meeting today to uh, the memory of Barbara Gorson. Um, we lost her to cancer this last weekend. Uh, she's a 20-year resident of Capitola and has been a tireless advocate for our libraries. She served on the Santa Cruz Public Library Joint Power Authority Board from 2004 to 2012, and she was the board chair in 2011. In addition, she represented the city on both the local and regional library advisory commissions from 2016 to 2018. In 2018, she was also honored as the Capitola Soquel Woman of the Year. Our symphony goes out to her husband, Billy, and her family. So with that, are there any presentations? Yes, I have the very happy duty to, with the first to introduce our new receptionist. I'll have Vanessa Graham work her way forward. Um, as you may recall, we promoted our other front desk person, Jackie Aloofy, and began our recruitment <laughs> and had, a, as we often do, a very significant response to the recruitment, interviewed eight people, and from that, uh, Vanessa was the number one unanimous choice of the panel, and she has been with us for seven days now, <laughs> <laughs> still learning who gets the calls when it's a fence permit and a pothole, and the people who say, I don't know who I need to speak with, as well as jumping in to help with all of the business license renewals that come this time of year. Um, we were all very taken by her um, strong background and experience in administration, as well as her warmth and commitment to being a team player. So welcome, Vanessa. Yes. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. I knew you were going to be here. It was a pleasant surprise to see you with a wonderful smile. And uh, you didn't know who I was, of course, but um, you dealt with it properly. Thank you. <laughs> Do you have any comments? Um, very happy to be here. Very happy to be working with the public and the city of Capitola. Yeah, we're happy to have really you. Really excited. Any other well, wel welcome, Vanessa. We Thank you, Sam. Appreciate having you here in Capitola. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. So I think we have something of note, an Officer of the Year Award, Herb Ross, and I believe the Chief will be presenting. <laughs> that was special. Thank you very much. <laughs> Good evening, Mayor Bertrand, council members, uh, staff, and, and guests, including just about the entire Capitola Police Department and many of the uh, family members and friends of Master Officer Guillermo Vasquez. I'm here before you, very honored to be before you tonight uh, to recognize and introduce Master Officer Guillermo Vasquez as our 2018 selectee uh, recipient of the Herb Ross, prestigious Herb Ross Award and our Officer of the Year. And so I'd like to invite Captain Daly to be up here with me on my right and uh, Officer Vasquez, if you can stand on my left uh, while I talk a little bit about uh, Guillermo's accomplishments. In a couple of months, I'll be celebrating my 33rd year in law enforcement, uh, a wonderful career. A and I'm being real honest and saying to you and Guillermo, specifically saying to you and your family, 
uh, that I have not seen many officers who work as hard and are as passionate about their work as Master Officer Guillermo Vasquez. So it gives me great pleasure tonight to introduce him as a recipient of our 2018 Officer of the Year Award. And I want to touch on a few things. Master Officer Guillermo Vasquez began, began his career with the Capitola Police Department in January of 2006. Throughout his 12 years of service, he has demonstrated the highest level of profes professionalism and dedication to the Capitola residents, our community, and his fellow employees and officers. For several consecutive years, Guillermo has led all officers in productivity and measured performance, always meeting the public's high expectations of law enforcement officers in today's challenging climate. Over the past year, as the police department struggled with significant staffing shortages, Guillermo demonstrated a selfless quality to serve above and beyond expectations. During the unexpected absence of a supervisor and due to his recognized expertise and leadership, he assumed the vacated supervisor responsibilities without the pay hmm. and tasks, supervisor responsibilities and tasks while maintaining his duties as a patrol officer. Specifically, he managed and maintained the department's entire technology and equipment program, including the body-worn camera program, management of our police department fleet program, facility security program, portable radio program, our cellular telephone programs for the entire city, mm -hmm. and all the cataloging, cataloging and auditing requirements uh, that are associated with the management of that difficult task. During this four-month period, Master Officer Vasquez's performance allowed the department to effectively serve our community by managing and maintaining the critical tools necessary to perform as peace officers. He displayed a tireless work ethic, fully supporting the needs and the vision of the police department while maintaining service levels expected and deserved by the citizens of Capitola. And so through a peer nomination and unanimous vote of supervisory and command staff personnel with the police department, Master Officer Guillermo Vasquez was selected and is tonight recognized as the 2018 recipient of the prestigious Herb Ross Award and Officer of the Year for 2018. My congratulations to Officer Vasquez. Yeah. You know what's going to happen next. <laughs> Somebody's going to ask you a question, so I'm going to get out of the way. <laughs> Good evening, Mayor, Council. Um, <clears throat> I am taken back by this. It's, it's a lot of work. And, uh, Thank you, Chief, Department Eds. Um, Sergeant Ross was about integrity, professionalism, and hard work. The words I lived by embedded in my head by my parents in the military when I served. I will close with part of a quote from Steve Jobs. The only way you do great work is to love what you do. And I appreciate my family being here. My Son Thomas, Caroline, my wife, Myra, her parents, friends and family, my coworkers. Sorry, I'm, <laughs> I really appreciate you guys being here. Um, I, I do this to make sure that every one of us is safe, our equipment works, and we can count on it when we need it. Um, it's a lot of work and a lot of hours of uh, calls, late calls. My wife knows that. <laughs> so thank you. Thank you to all. Congratulations. Thank you very much for your service to Capitola and stepping up when it was needed. City Council, is there a report from closed session? Nothing to report from closed session. Thank you very much. Um, are there additional materials? Yes, we received additional materials. Two public comment items for nine A, or excuse me, ten A, for item ten B at your dais, and in the back you will see that there is a revision to the proposed draft policy. There was a sentence added to that. Okay. And for item 10D, we also have a public comment. It had been previously sent and was requested to be included in tonight's um, agenda as a comment. Okay. Are there any additions or deletions to the agenda? Staff has no changes. Thank you. 
Um, at this point, we would like to um, open the dais for public comments. Are there any public comments from the <laughs> from the, the from people? Uh, yes, I see one person. Okay, and please sign your name at the um, dais if you'd like it to be recorded. Oh, my head. <laughs> Thank you. Um, let's see. Uh, my name is Denise Ellerick, and um, I wanted to come and briefly um, thank the City of Capitola for um, adopting the Extended Producers Ordinance, which requires pharmaceutical companies to be responsible for paying for the disposal of their um, narcotics, drugs, medicines, as well as sharps. Um, and part of what um, the community, I'm here with community prevent for Community Prevention Partners and the Safe Rx coalition of Santa Cruz County and um, we've been collecting data um, about people's habits and practices and awareness around the importance of disposing of unused medicine and um, and what they do and what they don't do and it's been very eye-opening and so we're about ready to release another survey on January 29th it's a follow-up so we're into um, and I know you value data and collecting data so um, what we want to um, continue to do is to raise awareness on the importance of removing unused um, medicines from the home. We still have data from our Healthy Kids surveys and from the Seven Challenges surveys that um, young people report that it's still pretty easy to um, get uh, medicine cabinet access and to find um, old Vicodin from wisdom teeth that have been extracted five years ago and that kind of thing. So. We'll be releasing the survey in Spanish and in English, and um, we um, what we're asking uh, City Council uh, to do is to um, consider helping us spread this survey. Um, I have some packets for all the council members. Can you come up, please? And um, I won't go over all of the um, boring details, but um, the exciting thing is that this community, Santa Cruz County, is the model for the state because of this extended producer ordinance. There's ordinances um, throughout the state and an, an assembly bill, I think it was 212. Um, so we have 52 locations at pharmacies and kiosks where people can bring their medicine and their sharps. And you can go on medproject.com and just put in your zip code and it'll show you where to go. Mm -hmm. um, and I have a little data that um, if I'm, I, I will forward it to you in an email, but you'd be interested to know that even in a small community like Capitola, per capita, Capitola had more opioids being prescribed than other parts of the community. And um, that's um, what, how that's important is we want to inform people on what to do with them when there's leftovers and they don't need them anymore. Um, so if you could help distribute them with your email databases, on your social media pages, once this um, survey goes live on January 29th, that would be greatly appreciated on the Capitola's Facebook page. Um, we're really going to try to collect a lot of data and get the information out there. Uh, the, the survey takes like maybe two or three minutes to fill out. It's really pretty simple. Um, and even just the process of reading the information about the data is, um, it just gets people thinking like, where is all that and what do we do with it? So um, we don't want people putting it in the toilet or putting it in the garbage. Um, we don't want it going into our water supply. And, um, and um, so I think it'd be very helpful if, if uh, I'll be sending a follow-up email to you all and um, in coming in March or April, we'll also come back to um, all the city councils with the results of the data that we collect. So okay, thank, thank you, you very much. Yes, um, city manager, can we uh, participate in helping to distribute this uh, survey and getting some more information out? Yeah, we'll take a look at what the information is and look at what's the appropriate venue, whether it's our social media or website, different okay. tools that we have available. Okay, thank you very much. Um, are there any more um, people from the audience that would like to speak? Seeing none, uh, close public one, comment. Yeah, one more. Where? Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> Did not see you get up. My fault. Is this the appropriate time to uh, speak on the uh, B uh, library construction update? No, that will be on the regular agenda. So again, uh, anyone else who would like to speak to something that is not on the regular agenda, I should have made that uh, statement earlier. Okay, seeing none, close public comment. Um, now it's city council and staff comments. Ed, um, I just have one thing. I just want to uh, add to a future agenda. I'd like to bring up an item to discuss the uh, current um, 
rope lights that are around the palm trees in the village. Okay. If if I may, uh, Mr. Mayor, I got an email from uh, a local uh, community activist uh, concerning um, a collaboration of local jurisdictions um, making an application for homeless assistance emergency program. Um, and in order for Capitola to participate, uh, we would need to declare a shelter um, crisis here in Capitola. Um, the county has done so, the city of Watsonville has done so, the city of Santa Cruz has done so. Um, and I would just would, um, I think it would be worthwhile for us to uh, consider that in order for us to be able to, one, be a county uh, participant um, in that effort to combat homelessness uh, and also to be able to have us uh, be um, eligible for the funding to be able to, um, you know, provide uh, um, such services uh, in the future. Now, however, I understand there is a, um, a deadline because the application is being submitted uh, on the 24th uh, and which is before our next meeting. Um, so I just wanted to bring that to the council's attention and see if there is any interest in maybe holding a special meeting. I also wanted to maybe ask the city manager if there is any update or, uh, or um, uh, interest from his perspective on being um, a, you know, really a county and, and uh, a regional player uh, in that issue. Mr. City Manager, is there uh, some information you could help us out on here? I think what I can share is, is that the deadline to make the declaration pursuant to the information that I got from the county, just the deadline got moved forward re relatively recently and the deadline would be the 15th. So if we were to make a disaster, uh, sorry, a shelter crisis declaration, we would need to do so at a special meeting either next Monday or Tuesday uh, to meet that deadline. And I guess I would add that, you know, our staff is available if council would like to schedule such a meeting and we can meet all Brown Act requirements if necessary. Um, to put together the information necessary for the hearing. Okay, so it's been suggested by uh, Councilman Sam um, Story that this would be something you'd like to see. What's the will of the uh, council here on this? This is in reference to the HEAP, uh, the HAP program. This is, uh, I had a briefing from the city manager on this topic and that, that, that's what this is in reference to. Yes. It's a one-time allocation of money. Um, I, in, in my, very limited knowledge of this. I, I felt like it was a fund that I would felt would be better appropriately used in different services in the county, and I didn't think that it was appropriate for capital to enter in at this time. So given the deadline, it isn't even something we can discuss. Uh, I don't have an interest to have a special meeting, but I will, you know, definitely attend at the will of the council. So I think for me, um, that to declare a homeless crisis in Capitola sounds, um, a bit alarming. It's a shelter crisis. A shelter, not, yeah. a shelter crisis. Um, and so um, I've done a, a, a little bit of research on this at this time and for me I don't think it would be a good time to, for me I wouldn't move forward with this um, to have a special meeting. There's a lot more to it I think um, about who allocates those dollars that I'm not sure that Capitola has a, a seat at that table for if that would come up um, and I don't think with the short enough or sh with the short amount of um, time that we have that there would be um, enough time to reflect on that there's a really short timeline for that and I think that we can look at different options that already exist different resources if we really want to think about the shelter in place or other options that of how Capitola can collaborate countywide well, just to clarify, uh, you know, our city manager does have a seat at the table. He sits in those meetings. Um, right. Um, so. Right. But from what I understand that there's a different subcommittee that actually would allocate those dollars. So I'm going to I'm going to have to do my duty here and yeah. interject. Thank you. Um, the Brown Act prevents the city council from having any from really discussion. substantive, meaningful discussion right. on the merits of unagendized topics. The conversation that you would be briefly permitted to discuss is whether to have a special meeting to further discuss the topic. I know that's a bit of a nuanced rub, but that is what is required. Sure. There's probably a number of community members who, if they knew this was on an agenda, may have wanted to share their information and share their opinions. So we need to provide them with the opportunity to participate mm -hmm. as well. 
Okay, John. Yeah, thank you, Reed. And, and I, I'm just bringing it forth to see if there's an interest in even in genderizing this. And I realize the timing is difficult, and um, but you know that's just the nature of, of um, um, you know the application process and where we are at this time. So, yeah. um, thank you, Councilperson Christie. Um, I, I'm not sure that, that moving forward with a special meeting for next week is the way to go. However, I do think it's important that we continue to keep these kinds of issues on our radar as we move forward. Okay, I don't see a motion uh, to move forward on this. And um, I do feel that, uh, actually I'm disposed to having a meeting next week because I think we need to air the issue. So I'm actually in favor of having a meeting next week. I'm not necessarily in favor of making this an emergency statement, but as stated earlier, it might be nice for the community to have a chance to participate in this. So at this juncture, we have Sam, uh, maybe we should have a vote whether we should proceed on this. It's not a motion, or how would we proceed on this actually? Well, my count of what I just heard indicates that there's not an interest in uh, having a, holding a special meeting. So um, I view that that makes the issue moot at this point. So, um, Does I mean, I'm happy to make a motion, but I just, it, it didn't appear that it was gonna pass, and so I, um, did, I didn't wanna push us to that. Okay, how many votes do we need for a special meeting to pass? So any, any vote would require, since there's five council members here, a, a vote of majority, but there is also the prerogative of the mayor to establish special meetings. So there is that sort of option invested with the discretion of the mayor as well. Okay. Hmm. So that puts me on the on the spot here. I would like to declare a special meeting for next week. Monday or Tuesday. Um, what's the best for everyone's agenda? Monday. Monday. They have League of Cities. Next week. Right. Monday. Monday. Okay. So uh, generally, our special meetings are held at six o'clock. Would that be the preference, or would you prefer to do the regular, a, a regular meeting time of seven? Six, six, six. Fine with me. six. Okay, so it's a term. We'll have a special meeting at six o'clock on Monday for this item. So now we'll move to boards and commissions. Um, I have one more comment. Oh, sorry. Is this there was other comments oh, yeah. to be made? Oh, yeah. were they? Um, is this a time that we would talk about the proclamation? Uh, um, announcement. A quick announcement. Okay, sorry. Um, so the city of Capitola, do, actually Jacques, would you like to read this? Um, the city of Capitola uh, mayor's proclamation is honoring Michael Wat Watkins upon his retirement from the Santa Cruz County office um, as superintendent. Um, so we will be presenting this uh, proclamation to him along with all three other cities in the county tomorrow at his retirement party. So now we move on to item 8A, boards and commissions. I think city clerk will be leading us in this discussion. Mr. Mr. Mayor, just before we move off the topic of comments, I just have one minor announcement that oh, I wanted I'm to sorry. make. It's quite I all right. I asked you to do this and I just, okay, my fault. It's quite all right. I, I did want to let the council and the community know that, that Merlon Geyer, who's the owner of the Capitola Mall, recently closed on the Sears property, which in the, means now that they own 70% of the Capitola Mall. Staff will be sitting down with the new owners of 70% of the mall as they indicate that they intend to move forward with um, a project uh, to talk about what's gonna work well for them and what's gonna work well for our community. So looking forward to that in 2019, it's hopefully a real priority project for the city. In addition, I just wanted to let the community know that previously in October, we had continued an appeal of the old application for the Sears property to next meeting uh, as the owners of the property no longer old owner of the property no longer owned the property, that application has went, been withdrawn and that continued hearing has been canceled. Thank you. Yep. Okay. So the nature of our communication is ongoing and do we have any meetings scheduled soon or how's that? We do, we have meetings with the representatives scheduled for not next week, the week after. Okay, thank you very much. That's great news. Okay, um, now we're on to uh, boards and commissions. Uh, City clerk, please. Yes, um, we will run through a series of appointments both for city advisory committees <coughs> and commissions as well as um, other jurisdiction boards and entities um, where we have representation. So I will begin with the city boards. 
Um, the first item up is the Architectural and Site Review Committee. This is a mayor's appointment. Um, these are professional positions based on um, the different requirements for planning and development. Both Frank Fanton, um, the architect, and Carolyn Swift, our historian, have requested reappointment um, to their position. So if it is the mayor's um, desire and the council's concurrence, we can continue to have them serve in those positions. No goals? Definitely keep them on. Very good. Second item is the Art and Cultural Commission. At this point, we are looking for the council member representative. One member of the city council sits on this commission. Um, and so at this time, um, for many years, that was council member Termini, um, and he has moved on. So we are looking for a new representative in that location. Anyone on the board that would like that position? Uh, Sam? If I may, I mean, just to let everybody know, um, as a planning commissioner member, I was uh, an appointee to the Art and Cultural Commission. Mm -hmm. I'm happy to continue in that role, um, um, but I, I'm willing to, you know, defer if there's someone that's really interested in uh, being on the Art and Cultural Commission. I have no interest in that commission, so unless anybody else has uh, okay. no. Well, I'd, I'd be happy. Yeah, please appoint me. Yeah, okay, thanks, Sam. You. Then, then you will continue in a new role. Wonderful. Thank okay, you. Okay. Thank you. Um, Commission on the Environment? Yes. Um, in this, first we need to determine it has one city council representative, so we will need to select a city council representative. Then the remainder of the council each picks an at-large member. Um, our mayor has been our representative, and so the question first is whether um, Mayor Bertrand would like to continue to serve on the Commission on the Environment, or if there is another member who would like to uh, take that position. If someone else would like it, um, I will see to that. Otherwise, I'll stay on. I think it's yours. Okay. And now we have appointments. That means that the rest of you will get to appoint someone. Unfortunately, I only have three folks for you to choose from at this point. We are still in recruitment. Um, Council member, Botworth, Peter Wilk, who was your appointee, has requested reappointment. Are you interested in reappointing? Absolutely. He's a great man. Very good. And um, Councilmember Peterson, Kathleen Atchison is interested in returning. Would you like to reappoint? Absolutely. And would either of our new members like um, to appoint Michelle uh, Barrett Soft Law, who has applied? Yeah, I would. Okay. Very good. And I will continue to recruit. Uh, right. And um, to the community, if you are interested in preserving um, the natural resources of Capitola online, the applications are available. Thank you very much. Next up is Finance Advisory Committee. Similar process. Uh, first, we have two positions um, for the council. They are first right of refusal for the mayor and the vice mayor. Um, mayor Bertrand, do you wish to continue to serve? Yep. Okay. And uh, vice mayor. Peterson, would you like to serve on the Finance Advisory Committee? Yeah, I'd be happy to. Okay, so in that case, the remaining three have um, the opportunity to make appointments. Um, Council Member Botworth, um, Paul Esty has been your appointee. Are you interested in reappointing? He can carry on, yeah, thank you. Very good. Um, Marilyn Warder, who was the Vice Mayor's um, appointee, is um, has requested um, a reappointment and we also have a new applicant douglas um, crowder uh, is, or any of our remaining folks want to want to claim an applicant um i would like to have douglas be my appointment and thank you for being here tonight <laughs> i'd like to reappoint marilyn mortar mm -hmm. well um that would need to be um, because you are serving yourself, you cannot reappoint. So, oh. but um, if Council Member Story would be interested in reappointing, oh, I'd be happy to do that. All right, then we have a full Finance Advisory Committee. Um, the last of the regular city um, boards is the Wharf Working Group. Um, it is primarily ex officio. Uh, business owners on the wharf and two council members. Council member Peterson has been serving um, on that and then we need a second commissioner so it's up to um, the vice mayor whether she wishes to continue serving and um, we would also like another member um, to step up. This is a periodic, there's not a regular meeting schedule for this group. 
I'd be happy to continue. Okay, so we have one. Is there another a member? That I believe these are usually mid midday meetings, correct? I, I'd be willing to do that if someone else is not interested. Okay, I'm Council Member Bottor. Um, the other two items related to city boards and commissions do not require any action tonight, or well, one of them may. Um, the Traffic and Parking Commission is up as a separate item under 10A. Um, we will be discussing whether to continue with that commission. If we decide to continue with it, then we will make those appointments. Um, and the other item is the ad hoc library design. Um, it is an ad hoc position. There, are, um, there have been no resignations or changes. So unless there are any um, questions or changes, um, there's no recommended action at this point. Has anyone talked to Mike if he wants to continue? He does. Okay, great. Okay, then we can move on to the boards on which we have um, representation. The first of those is the Capitola Public Safety Foundation. This is um, one representative appointed by the mayor. Uh, currently, Vice Mayor Peterson has been serving in that position. Um, is that a position you would like to continue in? I or will. Okay. If uh, just that's uh, mm -hmm. I feel like I should disclose to the council that uh, I am on the um, the Capitola Safety Foundation as just as a private citizen, not mm -hmm. in any other official capacity, but. So for the foundation. That means there'll be two, yeah, there'll be the two foundation. council members on it. I think that has occurred previously as well, yeah, so okay. it's not unusual. Um, another uh, board is the Criminal Justice Council. Um, we have two member representatives. Um, currently, uh, Mayor Bertrand has served on that, and we have an open slot. Um, do we have interested members for criminal justice? I'm interested. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I'll stay on. Okay. Should I? I would like to note that um, there's some time issue, timing issues. That I just want to point that if at the end it might be just for this re remainder of the year, we might have to bring that up again. Yeah. As I believe it is quarterly. I think I just got theirs. I think the first meeting is in March, but I could be confusing it with one other. Yeah. Um, but I will get you that schedule, and we will confirm that it works Thank with you. you. Um, this next item is one that rotates among the cities. It is the Local Agency Formation Commission. Um, the position that is coming up would start in May. It is an alternate, but I am told that alternates do usually attend um, these meetings, and again, they are, um, I think, every other month. Um, this is a nomination by the city, and then it goes to the county select committee, but the standard rotation has been that this would be Capitola's term, and it is a four-year term, um, May 2019 through 22. To, to be clear, it's an alternate for the first two years, and then the next two years, it's the I primary. believe it is a four-year alternate, but okay. I am. Council Member Baltorf, I know you served this previously. You Wasn't it, it two and, my recollection was it was two and two. There, uh, you, you know, can double check, I, it's I, in the packet. Yeah, <laughs> there you know, is I a description I in the packet. I did serve two and two, but I can't remember if I came in halfway through the rotation, so I don't know what the, what the actual, I couldn't verify the term. Yeah. I did, was an alternate for two years and then became a full member, and I don't know when uh, Santa Cruz would rotate out. Double check but me, it is in the packet if, if someone can pull up the, the letter from um, right. yeah, Pat McCormick. According to the agenda packet, it's, a, it's actually three years from <laughs> 2019 oh, yes, 19 to 22. To my 20 math 20 is off. <laughs> so we'll split the difference. So you guys, in between <laughs> yeah. the two of you. All right. so. well, on average, we were right. <laughs> I had the dates right, at least. So we are looking for an alternate. But as I said, um, their recommendation is that um, an alternate, even when the representative is there, they do like the alternates to stay um, up to speed on the issues. So they do like the alternate to um, attend. Is, do we have any members that are interested in? I would recommend it, but I'm not going to be around that long, so I'm not going to volunteer. But I mean, if, 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 if no one's willing to do it, I would definitely fill in, you know, to that alternate spot. But I, it's a good opportunity. I, I found it to be a, a worthwhile committee. But if, if you guys are busy and can't make that commitment, then I, you know, I would e I'd be willing to fill in as the alternate, and maybe when I leave in two years, someone might be go right to right to the front line. Yeah. I'm, I'm interested in being oh. the alternate. Yeah. Good. Good. Thank okay. you. Uh, 
Um, the next is Santa Cruz County Children's Network. Um, we have a council member currently representing us, that is um, council member, Mayor Bertrand, it is not required that this be a council position. Um, so he could continue, someone else could continue, or we could extend our recruitment um, to the community. So this is one that does not absolutely require an elected official to take this spot. Um, I'd be willing to give it to someone else on the board that would like it. Mm -hmm. I, I would love to take that one up. Thank you. Next is the Santa Cruz County Flood Control and Water Conservation District Zone 5. Um, this is the stormwater. Um, it is a subset meets with the County Board of Supervisors. Um, this has, again, a council member representative and a council member alternate. In this case, I believe the alternate is truly an alternate so and does not have to attend every meeting. I'll, I'll be glad to do that if no one else wants it move up from alternate into the representative Yeah, I'm position. the alternate now, yep. right? That's zone five, basically. Yes. Right? Okay. I'll so be alternate. No yeah. one else is interested. Yeah, we need an alternate. There you yeah. go. Thank you, Mayor and Vice Mayor. And then we have the Santa Cruz County Integrated Waste Management Local Task Force, another one um, allied with the county. Uh, we have one council member representative and one alternate. Um, this they prefer that the representative be a council member, the alternate can be um, a staff member if there is not um, so sufficient bandwidth. So on here, I'm, a, I'm the, rel um, the alternate, I mean, excuse me, I am the representative, and I thought Larry was on it, so I'm uncertain what the status is right now in terms of your report. So um, yes, the, the report that we have from them is their preferences um, council member as a representative and alternate, um, often alternates apparently attend and are staff members in for this particular um, group, but um, it is. Are you going to continue? Yeah, I'll be mm -hmm. glad to continue. Continue it? Yeah, yeah sure. Do we have anyone who is interested in serving as alternate or would we like to have a staff alternate? Can we see if our uh, current staff alternate is interested in continuing as a staff alternate? Yes. He I'm is. Saying he yes. Is. We're, we're getting a lobby in the that. back. He is. He's Let me put it this way. Larry was great at the <laughs> meeting, so. <laughs> he got me volunteered, so there you go. Turnabout's fair play. Yeah, it's a fair play, yes. Our, our next position is the Santa Cruz County Library Advisory Commission. Um, this is for the final portion of Barbara Gorson's um, term, which ends in March, and then for the upcoming four-year term, we do have an applicant, Bob White, um, who has been a, a member of our library advisory ad hoc design um, group and has applied for this position. So this would be a, a um, if council concurs to appoint Mr. White for this position. He seems Emily qualified, <laughs> I have to admit. We'd be lucky to have him. Do we need, right. a, do we need to make a motion? We can do it by concurrence. Okay. So. I think we, we all concur. I saw everybody's head nodding. Good. Okay, great. I saw nods. Great. Another library item. This is the Santa Cruz County Library Financing Authority. This one is council um, representatives. Again, a representative and an alternate. This, I believe, only meets twice a year. Um, once early February and then again in the summer. The meetings take usually under a minute. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> oh. So, <laughs> you're absolutely right. You you walk in and, and just about don't sit down. <laughs> okay, I'll be glad to do that. Um, as a representative, we do need an alternate though, because if you're not there and there's not a quorum, it's it's heck on the um, finances. So we do need. Is there an, an alternate, alternate available? No one else is jumping up at this opportunity. I'll yeah. be the alternate. I don't think they want me on the library. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Thank you, Kristen. Thank you. Next one up is the Santa Cruz Regional Transportation Commission, RTC. Um, this is a um, representative, actually. So to my surprise, does not have to be an elected official, but we've always wanted an elected official on it. Um, and it uh, currently, the mayor is our representative. 
it does not have any term limits and it is at the council's discretion whether um, to consider another representative or to continue with the current um, representative and alternate. We have um, currently the um, Mayor Bertrand has been the representative and Vice Mayor Peterson has been the alternate. So this is if there is interest in changing or if you wish to continue with the current representation. So I'm interested in staying on the position and okay. I'll volunteer to be the alternate. There you go. Okay. Sam? Okay. So and that is all of the formal items that we have. I believe that there is some interest um, in, in discussing casual um, areas where members have been served as liaisons. I, I'll go ahead I, and bring I've this heard. up just to okay. introduce it. Uh, there, there's a couple of informal committees that, that exist that, mm -hmm. that aren't on this list, but I just felt it would be a good time to bring them up since uh, one is there's a representative to the BIA and the other one is there's an informal group called the uh, Breakfast Club that two people would meet. Yes. And when you were last time with the, uh, with the yeah. uh, school board. Yeah. And I don't know who, who I think, I, I know that right now I'm the BA representative of it because of some uh, added duties with the RTC and the Metro. I informed them that I wouldn't be able to attend the meetings anymore. And uh, they were, um, it's not required that a council person be there. It's, it's really at their choice to have a, a liaison and that's more of what it was, it was a liaison. And I told them I'd come back to the council and just, advise everybody that they are going to discuss whether they want to have a representative and if they, they decide that they do they would reach out to one of the council members so I, I think I, you've done a great job but you yeah, do not feel you <laughs> you have the time to continue is that it or? yeah I, I just the, my duties for this year are going to be expanded so i just uh i move on so i just told them that they uh if they had an interest they could reach out to one of you and uh they, they were kind of amb ambivalent, like they may not even have an interest. So uh, I, I left it up to them. It's not a formal committee. I, I conferred with the city manager. And the other one was the Breakfast Club. And I don't even know who currently is doing that. Or Me. Uh, or and has that been ongoing, or is that kind yeah, of subsided? Yeah, Mike and myself, pretty much. Mike and yourself. So with the superintendent? Is that uh, no, is we it? don't. Uh, two members That's of the been school discussed. Board. Oh, school board. School board. It's been two discussed. members of the school board and two members of the city council, just to foster harmonious relations. Right. Yeah, mm -hmm. there's some discussion to start including the superintendents and the city manager. So that hasn't been finalized. And um, so the last meeting, we sort of got it to that point. So that's sort of informal. You're right. Uh, there's one that's not on here, and that's the. Uh, hey, do we want to just. I'll volunteer. Uh, oh, okay. Yeah. Do the school board meeting? I did that before. Absolutely, yeah. Sam. You and I were partners. Are you still want you still want to do it? Yeah, yeah. No, well, then that's that's, that's, yeah. okay. that's two. That's good. Yeah. Um, another one uh, that's not mentioned is the um, advisory board for the uh, senior uh, AAA. Mm -hmm. that, uh, so Stephanie did that. That is that term is they were appointed and their their terms are in process. They're we we, we have both a, a member and an alternate for two more years. Well, no, she's dropping off completely. She doesn't, it does not have to be an elected. So when, when she was appointed, she knew she was leaving and um, told me at the time that it was her intention to continue as our representative, um, even though she was leaving the council. So if she, well, is, if that is not her intent, I well, would need Yeah, I think her intent is to leave because we just talked about it. Okay, so I'll ask so her. So she will to need to, to send yeah. me a letter of resignation, but we do have an alternate. Um, so. well, actually, I'd like to step in her position, <laughs> as a matter of fact. But anyway, okay. So with that, I think everything's been covered. We have, we are done. Okay. Formal and informal. Okay, good. Is this one the BIA? Pardon? Is this one the BIA? Oh, they're gonna reach out. They're gonna out. reach out. Yeah. It's gonna be their selection. That's yeah. their selection, okay. So anything more from the board here? And thank you community members who have reached out to um, help us with the many fabulous and interesting meetings that we have. So at this time we get to the consent calendar and um, are there any items on the consent calendar that the board would like to pull or have further questions from staff? Seeing none, is there anyone from the audience that would like to pull an item for discussion from the consent calendar? Seeing Move none. the consent calendar. Second. 
All those in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. Moving on. General government and public hearings. Consider resolution for dissolution of the Traffic and Parking Commission. Is there a report? Good evening, Mayor and City Council members. As the title says, the item before you was uh, requested to be on the agenda from Councilmember Batorf, and it is a resolution uh, dissolving the existing Traffic and Parking Commission. I have a very short presentation for you here. Um, over the years, there's been several advisory committees that have advised the Council on traffic issues or in, and or village issues. In my 17-year tenure here, these four have been in place, the Neighborhood Traffic Advisory Committee, the Village Master Plan Advisory Committee, the Blue Ribbon Parking Committee, and now the Traffic and Parking Commission. Each of these committees was f formed to address a pressing issue, um, something that the council wanted uh, community input on at that time. Several of them continued on after that, um, similar to the Traffic and Parking Commission, but eventually uh, the committee was, these committees were dissolved um, as they got farther away from what their initial goals were. Uh, for the Traffic and Parking Commission, it was formed in 2009. It was formed to expand parking in the village, which it completed with the uh, construction and opening of the par lower parking lot behind City Hall here. They were also charged with trying to transition away from the single space meters and all the meter poles that were involved with that. And uh, we have successfully transitioned now to pay stations throughout the village and both parking lots behind us. Um, since addressing this issues, uh, the, count, the commission has developed an employee permit parking program, which is currently operating. Um, it's a one where any village employee can go online. Um, we give them a code. Once they come and ask for it, they can buy a monthly permit in the lower parking lot. Um, it's been in place since I think it was August of last summer. Um, right now, I haven't looked in the last couple of weeks, but there's probably nine or ten employees to take advantage of it at this time. Uh, they also worked on traffic calming projects, most like, uh, notably the jewel box traffic calming projects. Um, as I've mentioned in the staff report, I think that was a tough, tough assignment for them. Uh, without having the ability to actually enact changes. And I also think it was uh, misleading to the Topaz residents who thought they'd get approval from the Traffic and Parking Commission. They, they're, they're all set. So um, although they've worked on those, uh, I, I'm not sure that the uh, commission of this sort is the, pro is the right venue. Uh, if you look at the Hill Street traffic calming project, which we did, we had citizens come to us, the council member. Staff held uh, workshops. Um, that was attended by the community members. And then we came back to the council and had that. And that was a much more productive and efficient method for dealing with those types of issues. Um, and they also advised on three hour parking in the village. Interesting enough, they advised against it and the council voted for it. Um, and it is stuck and it's been a good thing. In the, and in the, I would say most of the commissioners have now agreed that it was a good thing that we changed to three hour parking in the village. Um, just looking at their meeting schedule originally, uh, when we were working on the village parking and the pay station issues, we were meeting twice a month. Um, and quickly, once we got through m those recommendations, uh, we went to a monthly meeting and we've continually backed off that. And right now we're meeting four times a year. So um, staff's recommendation at this point would to be approve a resolution taking the necessary actions to dissolve the Traffic and Parking Commission. And that's my report and I'd be happy to answer any questions. Any questions from uh, the council? If I may. Um, yes. Steve, is there currently a meeting scheduled coming up for the next yep. quarter or this quarter? Or? There is a meeting scheduled for January 23rd. Oh, okay. Ed? Eva? I have none. Okay, Chris. Is your question? Yeah. No. Okay. So, um, what do you think of the? Uh, uh, yeah, this might get into something else. Sorry. So, uh, no more control question. How about uh, comments from the public? Yes, please come to the dice. 
No, come to the dais. Yeah. Is it possible to make a comment on something that you went through before? Uh, no, we passed that item. I'm sorry. Whatever item it was. So we're right now considering the. Tra uh, yeah, that was. Uh, if you if you if you have an issue with the BIA and you want to be the representative, I'd reach out to the BIA at this point. It's up to them. So right now we're considering questions about the parking and traffic committee. Any members of the public? Okay, I don't see any. Bring it back to the board. What's the public's? Uh, what is the board's wish on this? Well, I brought this up, and, and, and the reason I did, I mean, I, when I started my political career in Capitol, it was on the parking commission, so it's near and dear to me, but it's, then we were seriously considering uh, prospects of a village hotel, we had the parking lot, there was all the issues that Steve brought up, and there was, like you said, uh, I said, I don't remember it being twice a month, but if that was the case, it was, we, we met quite a bit, there was good attendance, and the meeting was, the commission was productive, I thought. Uh, but there comes a point, as you can see with all those committees, where, the, you know, the productivity stops, and I think that it was really a stretch to push the parking commission into the uh, jewel box um, traffic dilemma. So at this point, I, uh, we had talked last couple of years about possibly dissolving the commission. I think this is a good time to do it. Uh, I totally want to reserve the ability to reenact or restart that commission should a village hotel come, you know, come uh, before us or any significant village change in parking design could be a mercantile rebuild or anything that, that would seriously affect the village that input from village business and from residents in the village, I think is, is essential. But at this point, I, I'm gonna make a motion to support staff recommendation, recommendation and dissolve the uh, Parking and Traffic Commission. A motion's been made, is there a second? Second. Okay, uh, further discussion, Yvette? No, I have nothing. Okay, oh, Sam? Well, I, I'm Sorry. just gonna speak out and say that um, I, I won't be supporting that motion. Um, and one mainly as a bit of process, because um, I understand that the actually Parking and Traffic Commission has not discussed this issue uh, and come forth with their own recommendation about what um, they want to do. Um, I also um, can see from the agenda packet that we have six um, residents um, who are interested in reappointment uh, to that commission, so it seems to me that there is ongoing interest on that issue. Um, I don't know that we've solved that issue, um, and to disband it, I think, would make it very difficult uh, to uh, re-engage. Um, so for those reasons, I think it may be a little um, premature to disband that commission at this time without hearing from them. Um, and um, and also, now I do recognize and I've heard that there's maybe a sense of, uh, of, of not adequate direction for them and focus um, and, um, and maybe we need to work on that. Um, but um, I would at least like to hear from the commission uh, on this question uh, before taking action to disband a citizen body. Any other comments? Okay, um, you, okay yeah. great. Um, we received some emails from some of the commissioners indicating their um, feelings about this. I understand that we haven't heard from, from all of them. Um, I'm, I am interested in dissolving the commission, but I would like to potentially throw out that we have the opportunity to also create it as an ad hoc committee, correct, if needed for specific uh, parking and traffic issues. Um, so I would just uh, just suggest that in the future when we do have traffic and parking issues come to us that we can reform that commission um, as an ad hoc committee um, with consideration of those six applicants that were most that were interested um, first and foremost before um, putting out for any other um, opportunities for anyone else to, to participate. Okay. Mr. Mayor, just one more clarification. Yes. Just, just for clarification on the six applications, two of those were from uh, village merchants that were just applying to fill the business spot on the position which one business owner had. So there weren't really residents. And I think that you know, a substantial amount of the people that have been on the committee for a long time, the chair uh, and Nels Westman, a longstanding uh, uh, person on, on that commission, didn't fail to uh, submit applications to renew and then even my representative uh, felt that there was not a, a, a real purpose or a reason to be fulfilling there so you know I, I don't bring that recommendation before us lightly and I do support what, what 
uh, Councilperson Peterson said about we can bring this back at any time. Okay. Um, when I first got elected last time, uh, one of the things I brought forth to this uh, body was that we need to look at the Parking and Traffic Committee and have it take on a role for the whole city. And when you look at the makeup of it right now, it's pretty much focused on the um, Esplanade and the, air, the central to Capitola. And that's good. And I think I agree with um, Ed that it served its purpose well and the report that Steve put out um, has listed a lot of their accomplishments, but they've all been pretty much focused on the center part of the city, um, some exceptions. Um, I also agree with Ed, I'd like to um, have us think about what a future committee would be when that time comes up. Um, I also agree with Sam, I would like to have um, one more chance for the committee to weigh in on this, uh, as I did the first time I was here when I asked them if they would take on the whole city as part of their um, purview, but with the idea that they would reform in a different way. So I would kind of like to um, have that and be against this particular motion right now and wait off until the next meeting when we get some feedback from the committee itself. So with that, let's have a We have a vote. commission because yes. of, we have two resignations and the, all their terms have expired. I'm just wondering if we have a commission right now to. Ah. Technically no. Technically no. Well, it puts us in a bind. Mr. Mayor, I would recommend calling the question and then if there's not, if the motion doesn't pass, then you can talk about appointments to the committee. Okay. <laughs> Call a question. Um, please, City Clerk. Um, Council Member Story? No. Council Member Peterson? Aye. Council Member Brooks? Aye. Council Member Bator? Aye. Mayor Bertrand? No. Motion Oops. passes 3 2. Okay. So moving on to item B, consider the library construction update and contract change order policy. Is there a staff report? Yes, there is. Let me just switch over here. So this is a quick update as construction is beginning on the Capitol Branch Library. Um, work began in earnest uh, probably, you know, over the holidays here, uh, recently completed work has included the contractor mobilizing and getting his job trailer set up on site. They did complete some tree trimming and the required tree removal for the new library site. They have surveyed the site, which you know, establishes the controls to make sure the building gets put in the right location and at the right elevation. Uh, they've done some the required utility locating to make sure we know where all our tie-ins are for sewer water, storm water, and all that. And they have uh, begun and done select vegetation removal, clearing and grubbing on the site. Um, upcoming work in the near future, and probably the biggest thing we're waiting for is to disconnect and remove the old electrical service. Uh, storm drain installation, they're gonna do some uh, advanced storm drain work in there to control site runoff since we're doing this in the middle, of, starting in the middle of winter. And um, they will then begin rough grading for the foundation. So, I think everybody's aware, if not, we have a webcam that shows uh, updated, I think it's every 30 minutes, a new picture of the site. This picture was actually taken yesterday. Um, the website's up there in red, it's very long and uh, kind of difficult, but uh, people can find a link to it on our city website at www.cityofcapitola.org. Uh, just look for a library website, webcam, you can also Google Capitol Library webcam and, and get to this web page. So you can see here's the site. Um, this is the location of the old library was right in here. This is the electrical panel that uh, is actually still powered and electrified that PG&E needs to come in and disconnect. It's right in the middle of the site where the library, so getting this disconnected um, has once again proven difficult to have PG&E cooperate. Um, and we're all trying. Uh, they've recently been pulled off uh, because of the storm events. Um, so we will continue to work on that. But you can see they've done the tree removal that was required along Wharf Road. They put the tree protection in where they're around the uh, top lot. Contractor's trailer back here. Um, so that's what the site basically looks like today. 
because um, this is a newly council, I kind of wanted to go back and just make sure we all understand where the funding for this project is coming from. Uh, there's $2.6 million from the former RDA. It was an agreement that was made between the county and the city when the Rispin property was put into the redevelopment agency to set aside $2.6 million for a future library. Um, so that is in this project. Measure S has contributed eight, $10 million to the project. It was originally $8 million, uh, but it was increased to $10 million um, when they both looked at the financing of Measure S and the uh, escalating costs for the library, not only our library, but all the li new libraries that are being constructed under Measure S. There's $1.55 million in the general fund money there. Uh, fundraising estimate uh, is $600,000. I think that's gonna be easily met and exceeded. Miscellaneous revenues in that has to do with some um, a variety of funding uh, debt obligations that the city has retired and the, um, residual money from that and other sources, uh, bringing total to $15.1 million uh, for our budget. Looking at the construction contract, um, the original contract, the low bid was $12,325,000 and a contract was awarded at that amount on in, back in July. It was awarded with a caveat that um, we were able to reduce those costs down to um, $11.5 million. Um, we have been working since that award uh, with the contractor, the architect, the engineers, the contractor subs to identify um, and actually put in place uh, changes to the contract and the project to reduce those costs. As of today, we have a we have issued contract change order one. The contractor has verbally agreed. It's just I think waiting for the right person to sign it in their office. That is going to reduce the contract by five hundred and sixty-six thousand one hundred ninety-three dollars. So right there, that will reduce the revised contract down to eleven million seven hundred fifty-eight thousand dollars. We have general agreement, and we're kind of just waiting for the process for making these official changes. Is we come up with the idea, everybody agrees, everybody kind of looks at it. The architect actually goes in and makes changes the plans, and then we submit those to the contractor, who then submits them to his subs to get the prices back. That's why it's been taking so long; is it's not an easy and short process. So there's another two hundred seventy-five thousand dollars that there's general agreement on. I think we'll, we're definitely going to get there. Um, it's just a, a timing at this point. So if you know, when that gets through, we will have a contract worth $11,483,496. Our target when the contract was awarded originally in July was $11,533,000. You can see we're, we're ahead of it. And that leaves a contingency of $967,000 um, in the project. So there's more than just the construction. Um, in the budget and so this is the full budget for the project as you can see 11 and a half million dollars for construction the design engineering is 1.4 million dollars the permits are currently at 140 thousand dollars project management we have a pro uh, you know a hired pro project manager for the project is 325 thousand dollars miscellaneous so miscellaneous is like the webcam um paying for that out of the project. Uh, some of the review fees we've had for permitting, uh, very nothing more than probably $5,000 in there, but those items add up. Uh, furniture, fixtures and equipment, furniture here is $700,000. That's as was well in the original budget and we've maintained that amount. We are actually, the library design committee is going to meet in February to start discussing the furniture. We have a year to get it kind of figured out. I know the library um, district has been working on furniture recommendations and that's what we're going to hear uh, from the architect in february and then uh, once again the same contingency of nine hundred and sixty seven thousand dollars as we go forward so one of the issues as we move forward is um, i'm sure most of the council is aware very rarely do we complete a project especially one of this value where we won't have some kind of change orders in there. Something comes up that wasn't anticipated. Something you know, plans weren't exactly accurate, or you know, things change, and we'll need to make changes to the contract. Some plus, most of the plus. Sometimes we get some minuses in there. Um, our current change order policy for the city 
allows the city manager to issue and approve contract change orders without coming to council of up to 10% of the contract amount. For our typical $200,000, $500,000 projects, that, that seems fair and adequate, and that allows us to kind of keep projects moving pretty quickly so we don't have to wait for the, you know, agendize it for a council meeting. But in this case, that $11 million contract would give the city manager $1.1 million of authority, which uh, staff felt was uh, a little too high, more than we wanted to. We wanted to make sure that the council and the public are able to track uh, the expenses and be as uh, or open as we can about that. So we are recommending that a new uh, change order policy be issued just for this project and only for this project. Um, and looking at that policy. So we're kind of taking advantage and developing two level, three levels of change, uh, change orders that would occur. First is a field order, and that would be the project manager and myself, the public works director, could issue changes of up to $20,000. It's really identified as they run into something they need, without stopping work, they would need to keep working. We're able to identify and keep the project rolling that way. The city manager would be authorized to issue up to $50,000. And then of course the, the next one would be a city council change order, which is uh, your limit up to there. Um, what we're recommending is that the field orders and city manager change orders will be reported to the city council every $100,000 or bi-monthly will come every other month, give you an update where we are on the cost. If we get to $100,000 before that monthly update will come to the council then. And the city manager and I, in discussing this uh, today, we realized that doesn't provide necessarily caps. I mean, as it was written in the, in the agenda packet, city manager could issue 10, $50,000 change orders without a cap. So we have added the line into the policy, which was underlined, which is in the handout you have, and it's also underlined in, in the presentation here, where cumulative change orders cannot exceed $125,000 without council approval. Uh, okay. So w together, the city manager and, and public works can issue change orders in those limits of $20,000, $50,000. But once we hit 125, we, we can't do that anymore. And we'll have to come back to council at that point. So that's that. So our recommendation is that you uh, approve the resolution, approving the proposed field order and contract change order policy as revised for the Capitol Branch Library project. Thank I'd be you. happy to answer person? any questions. Yes, any questions from staff, from um, of staff, excuse me. Ed, Sam, Kristen, Yvette? I have a question about something you said earlier. So it's just about this, and I'm sure we've discussed it before, but the library design committee about mm -hmm. furniture and stuff like that. I just wanted to bring something up about um, ADA and, um, mm -hmm. and accommodating people with special needs and special disabilities. And I'm just wondering when a good time would be to, you know, as council members invited to that or um, uh, to that meeting or when would be a good time just to, I know you want all of us there. <laughs> um, uh, there's uh, currently no council members on there, so there's no Brown Act problems with, with somebody coming in. And I think that would be fine for somebody to attend. Or could I just email my suggestions or ideas or whatever you would like to do, I think would, would be fine. So for just to address ADA, certainly the, right. the design of the building yeah. has met all the current ADA standards. Absolutely. And so furniture and, and all that, we're really re relying on library staff to assist us with that, but we'd have you look at it. And if you have any suggestions, we'd, be, yeah. we'd love Live to hear. Live Oak um, Library has uh, recently purchased items in addition to their regular ADA items that I've been working with them on. And so I would love to see that also at the Capitol. Uh, at our yeah. library. So February 20, uh, I'll have to get to you with the, the date, okay. maybe February 13th. But okay. I'll get okay. to you with the date. If you can't make it, just send us an email and I'd have to happy yeah. to bring it up. 13th? February 13th. 13th. Thank you. No questions. Yeah. yeah. Okay. I have a question. Um, so not familiar with um, how the whole process works. Um, I could understand how things come up and you need to decide right then and there because of time constraints and moving the project along. Um, but normally when we award a contract, we go out for bidding and such. So how is it decided that this is a reasonable amount for the change order? So it's, it's a negotiation between the city as a contract administrator and the contractor. 
Okay. Um, we, there's several ways you can do a change order. You determine that it's certainly, a, you know, first you agree that it's a change to the contract. Right. It's extra work that wasn't identified. It's not a bid item. It wasn't identified in the plans. There's several ways it can be identified. The, we can direct the contractor to go on time and materials. Okay. And so he you know, starts counting all his equipment that's used for that, addressing that issue, and you pay him on the time and materials. If it's just, let's say they're the sewer, you're building a pipeline and the design is 100 feet short, you agree to pay that additional contract price that's in there um, in, the, in the bid item. Or it's just something that was completely unanticipated, and but it's quite large. You'd probably go back to the contractor, have him give you a price, and, and negotiate that price. But okay. So it sounds like you have tried and true methods, depending on the situation to yes. deal with this. Like I said, there's practically change orders on every project. So. Yeah, that's what I'm, I just want to get an idea how that works. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, um, Mr. Mayor, maybe. Yes, Sam. Yeah, I'm sorry, but I, actually a, a question did occur to me, and, and Steve, um, I noticed under the new policy, it's you bringing it back to the council, if cumulative orders or a single one exceeded $100,000, um, is that whether it increases or decreases? Um, and because I noticed there was one change order already for half a million dollars, um, would that be subject to this policy? S Ah, good point, good point. Yeah, good so point. when the council awarded the original construction contract of 12.235, mm -hmm. whatever, $325,000, they gave the city manager authority to sign a series of change orders to reduce the contract amount. So that was part of the original award. So we have a new base. Right, that right. We're starting yeah. So we have authority to issue those change orders already. Mm -hmm. Typically those would need to come back um, and I, I kind of see us only coming back if we're increasing the price. Um, yeah, that's what I was wondering. Yeah, I mean, because I, I don't know if you need deductions to. Deductions are, are a lot easier to process. Right, <laughs> right. Uh, yeah. Okay, just, and, and maybe we can reflect that in the resolution that it only involves increases to the budget, yep. but not decreases. I think we can add that in there. Okay, that's a Thank good. You. Good the other note point. I would add is, is we, we are proposing bi-monthly updates with the council, just yeah. even if we don't have more than $100,000 worth of change orders, just to keep, this is such a significant project for the city to make sure everybody remains in the loop. Mm -hmm. Any more questions of staff? This time I'd like to open up to the public. Any questions from the public? Mr. Mayor, members of the city council, my name is Mark Kane and my wife and I for residents here in Capitola. And uh, these numbers, I, I've, uh, this is the first time I've seen them. Um, but I don't believe in giving the city manager more leeway to approve increased construction cost change orders is responsible. And uh, I'm not questioning any of your integrity. Um, but uh, what I haven't heard is uh, the hard number. How much is this going to cost? Because uh, I think the answer isn't to make it easier to write checks out of our general fund, which I, I, I think is uh, irresponsible. Uh, but how about keeping the library project on budget? And, and what is that number? So how does this happen? Well, keep the project on budget. And to do this, we need a budget number. Uh, or B, scale back the project to be within that budget number. Or C, stop the project until a later date. Uh, these change orders, it's a dirty word. The private sector doesn't uh, get to do uh, these things. Um, in fact, private sector builders are canceling projects today because of high costs. And we already have the land. So the land value we already have in this project. So uh, we started off at what, eight, and now we're at 15.1. And, uh, but we have money from uh, this design change and uh, uh, this fundraising and this and that. So I. On the issue of uh, just giving the city manager uh, approval to uh, uh, make these changes, uh, to fund these changes, I, I don't think is right. Um, I mean, it's a brand new building. <laughs> it's all figured out. There's, you're not doing anything new here, or not recreating anything. Uh, if they can't uh, do this without making changes, then it's the wrong person. I mean, I'd love to be a contractor and be able to make changes. 
I mean, that's how they make a lot of their money. Um, anyway, uh, the uh, other thing that disturbed the heck out of me was the vote on the uh, homeless thing. And uh, uh, I understood the, the lawyer to say that we'd have a public comment before that, or? Uh, that was, um, uh, we're not on that subject right now, but to answer yeah, your question. No. You just kind of threw it in there and just backed off yeah. of it. I don't okay. think that's right. Okay. Um, to answer your question, we were uh, agendizing a future meeting. So it wasn't something that we're going to talk about now. We're going to talk about it at a future meeting. When does the public get to talk about it? Uh, the future okay. meeting will be Monday. So anybody that, uh, anybody from the public has until Monday to come here and, and, uh, and, and have their say on it? Yes, sir. I think that is just friggin' wrong. Okay, well, thanks for your comments and the comment No, no, over. no, you're out of line here. Okay, um, I understand your frustration, but- You don't understand my frustration. I'm born and raised in San Francisco, and the homeless problem is, is everybody knows what it is there. And here we're gonna, uh, what is the thing? I don't get it, it's a sore, sore subject for me. Okay, sir, I'd like you to come back Monday, please. But it's a private meeting, isn't it? No, it's no. open to the public. But I, so I get my buddies together between now and then. The meeting is open to the public. And it affects the whole city, right? Thank you very much. Yes, it does. Okay, so we've had public comments. Um, bring it back to the city council for its uh, direction. Ed? Yeah, I'll start in. I, 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 Mr. Kane, I, I was gonna address your points real quick on the library, uh, and I just wanna acknowledge that I've kind of been a little hawk on the money for this library from the start to finish. So I'm sensitive to how much we're spending. And I think the important thing to note is that the library was extremely over budget, and uh, that problem was resolved with the county funding an, an additional $2 million, which uh, made us in a position where we didn't have to redesign the library, and we didn't have to come up with any additional capital of money. The money was all funded from another source, the county, uh, through Measure S. So at this point, um, you know, I, I'm pretty confident that the library is gonna be, as you stated, on budget, on task, and it should stay on. But what there is in there is, if I'm, correct me if I'm wrong, Mr. Chief Manager, there's a $975,000 contingency fund in there, and every project has a contingency fund to allow for overruns, should they happen, should they start digging the footing and find an, an underground gas tank or, or anything else that, that could happen that's not uh, predicted or something else that comes up where an improvement is suggested to be made that benefits or behooves the city. So that $975,000 is there and, and what happens is we're, we, rather than to us to have a special meeting all the time to approve 20,000 or 50,000, we're giving some leeway to the uh, public works director to make a decision or the city manager. And I, I just recently uh, took a position with the RTC and was told today that the RTC's contingency fund uh, is allowed $20,000 for every occurrence and the chair can authorize 50,000, which would be similar to the numbers that we're drawing up here. So I believe the numbers are consistent with a, with a moderate amount of uh, leeway for, for what the, the manager of the city would be expected to do. And I think the main thing I'm concerned about is, is they, they took the time to put the language in there that says that if these numbers do exceed $100,000 at any given time, the council will become aware of it because I'm with you. I don't want this 100,000 to become 600,000 and then all of a sudden our 975,000, $967,000 is gone. So uh, I appreciate your comments and I can assure you that I will be keeping track of every dime that's spent on the library. Thank you. And with that, um, uh, I, uh, accept the report. Uh, with I accept this uh, recommendation of staff, and I make make a motion that um, approve staff recommendation. Any second, second on this? Well, just to further clarify, and uh, I'll second the motion. Okay. Um, what we're being asked to do is to limit the city manager's dis discretion from where our policy currently stands. <laughs> um, it provides for a much greater latitude, and and so I think this is moving toward more oversight and more responsibility on the part of the city council. Um, and for that, I support um, the recommendation. Okay. Um, any other comments? Before, I have no comments. Before roll call, can we, yes. uh, as Councilman Story recommended, can we add uh, cumulative change orders that add an additional $1,000 to the project increase okay. so that we're not coming for a deduction? Okay, does that agree with you? That's fine. That's fine. Yeah. Friendly amendment, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Uh -huh. 
so is that this is in the underscored just to add the word hundred and twenty five thousand dollar increase Great. Yep. thank you okay can you call roll call vote please well the, just if i may oh, i'm sorry mr mayor I, I think there was somebody in the audience that uh, had their hand up I've got a feeling he missed public comment, and maybe you could allow him leeway. Yeah, I, I, That's I up to no the discretion of the mayor, but maybe we should vote, and then you can yeah, make let's that vote. Yeah, let's get a general comment from you. But let's vote on this. Uh, City Clerk, please call the roll. Council Member Story. Aye. Council Member Peterson. Aye. Council Member Brooks. Aye. Council Member Bator. Aye. Mayor Bertrand. Aye. Thank you. Motion Council. passes unanimously. So at this point, because someone did come here uh, to make a special comment, and they didn't do that earlier, uh, let's have an exception and have you come up, please. Timer. Linda. Timer. Oh, I'm missing my treasure. <laughs> I, I so you'll have three minutes to speak, sir. Okay, my watch is on. Well, there's a I timer that's going to be oh. set. No, there it is. There you go. We have the fancy version. You got it? You yeah. Ready? Okay. So. <laughs> uh, my name is Jamie McVicker, and I'm an outsider and a bit of an insider, and in this has become a new home for me. I'm from Washington, D.C., and for many, many years, I was the president of award-winning communications firm, and we represented economic development departments, including Arlington, Fairfax, et cetera. And I've had a lot, of, a lot of other involvement, some on an investigative level with municipal departments as well. So that's kind of just a general background. Um, I have been here for the last three winters, and one of the things that you mentioned was the BIA, and you're very highly thought of and appreciated for coming to those meetings. You have not met me there. I've had the ability, though, as an outsider, to take a look at the village and the business conditions in the village and get to know quite a few of the residents. And the reason I'm addressing you is there's a problem in Houston. And I, want, uh, and, 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 and I sort of want to raise this so that you understand as you're approaching your function that there are some serious issues to address. You may not be aware of it, but currently right now there are 16 vacant buildings in the village looking for tenants. That's a rather alarming number uh, considering uh, the number of buildings there are. Um, one of the reasons, Ed, that I think there was a little bit of ambivalence about a council member approaching is I can honestly tell you that the relationship between the business people in the village and the town right now on a one to 10 scale would be about a one and a half or two. But I would urge, and I think Sam's story, because I read some of the comments you made, I'd really urge you to get involved. They represent the village. It's an extremely important part of California. The issues we're dealing with are very, very complicated. As you pointed out in an early article, the retail landscape has changed. Some of the policies that you had put together years ago may have worked then. I don't think that they're working now. These people struggle. Try living without six months of paychecks a year because that's what they do. It's not just a matter of events. Right now, when a building comes up, randomly they hire a commercial broker. That, that guy goes out, tries to find anyone that's willing to pay the rent, and then randomly it flows from there. When I worked with economic development departments, there was we worked together with the government. When a building came up, we met with those brokers. We helped them find the kind of people that would be a blend and a mix to draw for everyone. Believe it or not, the village is also looking dog-eared, and there's a lot of problems with the consumer experience, from parking to some of the things. So anyway, what I'm urging is that maybe Sam's story, because I read what you wrote and I agreed with what you had to say, do become involved with the BIA. There's a lot of issues ahead of you guys for the next few years if you want the village core to continue to be prosperous. Wow. Those are great <laughs> comments. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. Appreciate those. Would you leave your contact information, please? And, and just to let me say, and if the BIA should reach out to me, uh, I'm happy to work with them. So. Okay, moving along. So we're now on uh, consider changes to the treasurer, uh, references in the municipal court. Uh, discuss and implement a, of the voter uh, approved transition from an elected to an approved appointed treasurer and provide direction regarding how the treasurer appointment will be made. Is there a report? There is. Um, 
as you will recall, in November we got a definitive yes from Capitola voters in support of making the treasurer an appointed position as opposed to an elected position. Um, the immediate action taken um, to do that was simply removing the word elected from our municipal code so that when we talk about our treasurer, we just simply refer to a treasurer. Um, however, we need a process, um, and the need for that was expedited by the fact that our treasurer resigned to take a position on the planning commission. Um, <laughs> one of the, and another reason that we need a, a treasurer is it is required by um, the state code. The state code lists um, Several duties among those are the collection of fees and taxes, accounting and auditing of bonds, and providing monthly accounting reports to the council. So these are duties that the state has assigned to a treasurer um, and which we need a treasurer in order to carry out. In Capitola's municipal code, we identified several other areas um, where the treasurer is referenced that the council may wish to um, look at and make uh, amendments to depending on what decision they make as far as how this appointed position um, will be processed. The first one is within uh, chapter 2.04. This talks about the creation of the treasurer position. Um, staff is suggesting that we acknowledge that it is an appointed position within this. Um, depending on your direction, the language would be shall be appointed by either the city council or the city manager. So that is one section that staff has identified and is looking for direction. Um, the second is the code section defining the duties of the finance director. Um, and section D lists how that position interacts with the treasurer's position. Um, two parts to this, one is we realize that the code still references the redevelopment agency treasurer, and we don't have a redevelopment agency or a redevelopment agency treasurer um, any longer, so we are recommending that all references to that um, be stricken. And then we are also offering some options as to how that uh, relationship is described. Um, much of it remains the same. One option is adding that the director of finance may also serve as the city treasurer. If that is an option that you wish to add, this is a place that staff has identified that might be a logical place to, um, to add that option. In uh, further down in chapter two, uh, this is for the city manager, and this addresses the positions that, um, that the city manager may appoint. And currently, the only exceptions are the city attorney and the city treasurer. Should you decide that you wish to give the option of appointing the city treasurer as you did back when the city clerk was made an appointed position, um, the city clerk used to be on this list, it was removed. If that is the decision and direction you go with the city treasurer, then we would recommend that um, and city treasurer be stricken from this portion. And then there's the always the odd oddballs. Um, we found that for some reason it, use, it requires that people tell the treasurer that they've sold their dogs. <laughs> um, microchipping addresses that, it, that is more appropriately handled by animal services and so we are recommending that that section also be um, removed. So at this point what we really need from you is to determine um, how you want to go forward with appointing, whether it's by the city council or the city manager. Uh, we have something kind of pretty much in place. Should you go with the city manager? That's what, we, as we said, we do with the city clerk um, position. Um, if the council wishes to retain that appointing um, authority, we will need more direction. How do we do that? What kind of um, application? Staff is happy to bring forth something, um, but there will be another step um, and, and a little more work involved in identifying exactly how you would execute that authority. Um, we would also like direction on the sections of code that I just um, went over, whether you, um, depending on which direction you take, which sections um, and what wording you prefer. 
Um, and once we have that, we would bring those changes back to you to begin the process of revising the ordinances. Any questions of our city clerk? I have a question. Okay. Is it possible to do some kind of combination of the two um, in terms of who appoints? Is it possible to say, for example, appointed by the city manager um, upon approval by the city council? Uh, I'm going to punch to the yeah. to the table with the JD over there. <laughs> so, I, I think that if there was a two-step process, it would be something along the lines of the city manager would nominate, uh, and the city council would ultimately appoint, but the city manager would nominate. I think that would probably be if you if we wanted to identify a two-step process, that would be the way to do it. Thank you. Any other questions? Seeing none, are there any questions for the public? Mayor Bertrand, city council members. Um, first of all, as the former treasurer, I, I had no dog ownership uh, application. <laughs> so if you want to put the chief of police on that, I'll, I'll be happy to support. Um, I endorse the proposal that, that the city manager appoint um, the um, treasurer. I would assume that he would appoint the finance director mm -hmm. and that would eliminate a redundant bureaucrat, which I think is a very popular notion, but it also uh, reduces costs associated with the benefits um, that the city treasurer has to um, incur and in their communications with the treasurer, his training, his or her training, and potential salary savings. So I think in general it is a good idea uh, from a cost saving standpoint and, and a, a bureaucratic reduction standpoint to have the city manager uh, make the appointment, and, and I'm assuming he will make the city treasurer, the, I mean, uh, the finance director. But there's one consideration that I wanted to bring up that uh, is missing in this approach, and that is the loss of a citizen review of the city invoices. Now, that's something that I enjoy doing. I know the mayor had enjoyed doing when he was the treasurer, um, and I think that could easily be remedied by just em empowering the financial advisory committee to appoint someone to sign off on the city um, invoices that would in, uh, that would um, improve that committee's insight into the way the government runs and in the, and their influence and it gets a fresh set of eyes an independent set of eyes on those invoices so that's the one thing I think that might be missing from the, uh, the notion of an appointed treasurer but I think it can be easily remedied. Thank you. Thank you. Any comments more from the public? Seeing none, bring it back to the City Council for discussion. Sam? Um, Peter, I'm glad you mentioned the Finance Advisory Committee because um, I guess um, I'm thinking that, uh, number one, I would like to hear from them yeah. about um, how the treasurer should be appointed and by whom the treasurer should be appointed. Um, it would seem that, uh, I mean, we have this body. I think we should utilize them, get their input. Um, I, ca I understand the, um, the, the interest in streamlining, but I don't know where fiscal um, um, matters are concerned. Seems better um, a, a procedure for financial controls to have multiple eyes looking over your ledgers. Um, so in that spirit, I would like to hear from the Finance Advisory Committee. I would be interested in maybe having them uh, uh, appoint uh, or select who the treasurer would be. Um, maybe it could be the chair of the Finance Advisory Committee, um, as long as you know they operated under the um, kind of the representation to the community that it would be an experienced and capable person in that role. Um, so those are my thoughts and um, recommendations. Kristen? Yeah, um, I, I think it is important that we hear from the Finance Advisory Committee. Um, but I also have faith in our city manager. Um, I, I bring up the potential for a two-part process only because I have heard from citizens who are concerned about there being less um, involvement by the city council or less oversight by citizens in general. I don't necessarily share that concern, but I do feel that it's my responsibility to 
bring it forward as something that I have heard from citizens. Um, so that's really my only comment right now is that um, I think it's worth at least considering uh, having a two-part process that involves both the city council and the city manager. Yeah. So I would agree with uh, what Kristen was saying. I I recently asked our um, our council here um, about well, what would that look like if we didn't didn't agree with the appointment made by city manager? What are the next steps, and what how could we get out of that? And so th I I have some similar concerns of kind of losing uh, count, uh, city council not having so much as a so much say in who would be appointed. So I'd be interested in looking at a two-step process as well, and I agree that the finance, finance committee should have some uh, sort of input, and I think that piece is missing. Um, so yeah, I think that, that's it. Ed? Yeah, um, you know, I wanna go back in time a little bit, because it's what we did here was we took a lot of time to put this on the ballot. Uh, to, the idea was we were trying to streamline government Okay, and we had a lot of discussion, and I appreciate all the efforts of our former treasurer, Peter Wilk, because he came on and took this job for two years, and his task was to, you know, to, to come up with a, with a reason why we needed to have an elected treasurer, and he said, you don't need to have one, and I, I, I appreciate those comments, because I, I think they were sincere from having done the job for two years, and I'm here trying to find a way to streamline government. I see every other city in this county that does the same exact process. I mean, we, we had a, uh, um, oh, what's the word I want to use? Very dynamic city clerk here before that started the process that it shouldn't be uh, uh, a, a elected city clerk. It should be one appointed by the city manager. And, and that has become a successful system. And that's what I think we're doing here with the treasurer. We're, we're, we're recognizing that the person that does all the work, that, that assumes all the responsibility, is our uh, finance director. And this is just consistent with at least, I think it's up to 60% of the cities in the state that now run their operations that way. Uh, I'm not worried about oversight because two of the people on the city council sit on the finance committee and we have an oversight committee, the finance committee. So the oversight's being done, but uh, you know, I, I am willing to incorporate some of the good suggestions made by the treasurer that, that you know, if we have invoices that we could have uh, um, there's some way that, the, that they make a recommendation about how they look at invoices. But I don't think, I think it's our job to run the city. It's not, you know, the finance committee is an advisory committee that advises us. They advise us throughout the year on sp budget expenditures and we make the ultimate decision. So what I'm here tonight to do is to, you know, give the city manager direction. And what I've heard is, is uh, Councilmember Peterson brought up that the, a, a two-part system. And I don't have any problem with putting a second step in, in, into the uh, process of the city manager is that he makes the appointment and then he recommends to us and it comes to us at a formal meeting and we can either approve it or deny it and that way we still have ultimate control. So that totally makes sense to me and it's just another step in his process that I don't think is gonna uh, mess up how we do things. So at this point I'm gonna make a recommendation that we, um, a motion that we uh, have the finance, that the city manager makes an appointment. Uh, you had me four questions here, Linda. I'm going to try to address these. City manager makes the appointment. Uh, whether you want us to say, uh, with, with the with the with the inclusion that the finance director as treasurer, subject to council approval. That uh, I think that's what, what what's come there. Uh, delete the language for city treasurer and all the places you had and delete anything to do with dogs and add, um, you know, this is where I would take the input from the, from the finance uh, committee is that to direct them that they come up with a recommendation on how they would like to review invoices. And as long as we have some way that is included that they're looked at, I don't need to determine that. I don't think the city manager needs to determine that. And I think it could come from a recommendation from them on how to look at those invoices. So that's my motion. Is there a second? Second. Okay, so there's a motion and second. I'll, I'll make a few comments. Uh, thank you, Peter, for talking about um, this issue and reminding me about um, the review of the invoices. Um, I have to admit, um, so if um, city council does 
go this way, I think the uh, finance advisory would have to come up with some method, obviously. Um, first of all, finance advisory doesn't meet on a regular basis. Uh, we had to review it every week, right? And so that's, that's quite a task. Every week, you and I had to review all the invoices. And sometimes, especially if you don't know what's going on, it takes a while to get used to that. But it was very instructive. So I think that's been incorporated when Ed said. I totally agree with that. And um, I'd like to call the question, unless there's any more comments. No more comments, please call the question. Councilmember Story? No. Councilmember Peterson? Aye. Councilmember Brooks? Aye. Councilmember Botorf? Aye. Mayor Bertrand? Aye. Passes 4 1. Thank you very much. Uh, moving on to item D community block grant CBD application. So we need to hold a public hearing and defer consideration of the attached resolution. So is there a presentation on yes, this? Yes, we have a short presentation. Um, the item before you right now is uh, consideration of making a application for the 2019 Community Development Block Grant Program. Um, just to give us some background, in 2017, the city did make a CDBG application. Uh, we applied for three items. One was a $250,000 grant for a housing rehabilitation program. Another two hundred fifty thousand dollars for our home buyer assistance program, and then a one point nine million dollar uh, application for Clare Street traffic calming project. Unfortunately, for various reasons, under each item, all these three of these applications were unsuccessful and not funded. Uh, CDBG um, recently issued a second round or their next round of. Uh, applications and at this time we're seeking council's opinion um, action to whether we should apply or not uh, it does require two uh, public hearings be held the first one doesn't have to be before the council and the community development director and i uh, held that public hearing previously and nobody attended uh, it's pretty typical for this type of project um, or grant application so Right now we can consider the items that we approved in 2017 and um, both the community development director and I are gonna talk about them really quickly. So the Clare Street project, um, we are not recommending that we reapply for that funding. Um, the CDBG program for public improvement projects is really geared toward assisting at need communities with water, or sewer um, or direct health related issues and funding those type of projects. 100% of their projects that were funded in 2017 were either water or sewer projects. And we're talking where you know, sewer systems are broken, sewage is bubbling to the street or water is undrinkable. They're under cease and desist orders from the state. And there's enough of them out there that they use up all their funding on that. We were told going in that getting a street improvement project approved is difficult and, and approve that. What it is is there's, they, they evaluate it on a needs basis and we got half the points, I think it was out of 250 points, we got 125 points from that. And just that right there um, <coughs> is enough to, was enough to keep us from getting funded. There are some other items in their scoring sheet that we didn't get 100% on, but we, which are correctable. But um, I just think it's our opinion that it's very unlikely that we would be successful with another grant program. If we did want to improve, move forward with it, it's about a $5,000 um, to have uh, an application prepared. So um, regarding the housing grants, I'll now pass it off to Katie here. Okay, um, so the housing grants, originally I drafted the report to say that we, were, we wanted to move forward with uh, a recommendation to move forward for the housing grants. I learned after our first public outreach meeting um, that the housing authority no longer wants to participate in the housing rehabilitation program. In talking with Mark Failer of the housing authority, he said it was very staff intensive. They um, have to get bids for upgrades for um, home improvements, and it's typically within the mobile homes. Um, and there's a, a requirement for three bids. There's only one local contractor that participated the last round, and um, they don't have the staff 
with the timing that was the demand that was placed on the housing authority. It was a, um, a great program, it, although labor intensive for our partner. So at this point, I'd recommend, I think the grant applications are gonna open up new ones this summer. I'd like to first identify who our new partner is going to be uh, before, if, if you're awarded a grant and you don't carry it out, then the next round of grant um, reviews, we wouldn't rank high because we didn't spend the money in the last round. So right now we're of good standing. We spent all the money in the last go around. And the, the two projects coupled together, the home buyer's assistance project, that's typically, it's hard. Um, in the last go around, we qualified one property owner for the, that grant, but we could, there was flexibility in the spending that any money we didn't use in that program could be utilized towards the rehabilitation program. So we did utilize both uh, the whole half a million dollars, but I really wanna make sure we have our partner in place before we move forward, because I'd hate to get allocated the money and not have the, the means in which to carry it through to our um, residents. So therefore, we'll, I'll, you'll probably see me this summer coming back once the grants open again and hopefully I have someone in, in place. And, I, and I've reached out to our, um, to people within the region and have gotten some good feedback of, on leads of who our next partners could be. So we're working on it and hopefully we'll have something in place. Any questions? Yeah, any questions? How hard is it to find a partner? Because I've, my own knowledge base here is that there's a whole series of contractors that specialize in mobile homes, for instance, and uh, that's their customer base. So I'm just curious about why we couldn't find a partner last time and what's going on. Uh, it's interesting. We actually, I had an inquiry from another jurisdiction today asking um, how they got people to respond to the, how we got people to respond to our RFP in the first go, uh, when we initially went through this, when Rich put out the RFP. We sent out 15 RFPs to different housing groups, mm. and only one responded to our RFP, so we ended up doing a sole proprietor. Um, mm. And it is, um, in, in sending out emails to other jurisdictions on trying to make a fix for this, the one comment I've heard back is, this is very staff intensive, and uh, um, like the county of Santa Cruz dropped their rehab program because of that, and they moved into a different program that's not funded under CBDG, but is funded under the home program. So just, uh, I'm learning of, uh, we're not the first one to get this feedback. And the um, amount that's, the administrative amount that's given to the, um, housing implementer is a set percentage, and they often put a lot of work into these, but the amount that they're receiving from the grant money just doesn't add up to the amount of work put into the program, so. I, the, oh, sorry. Yeah, um, comment from the city manager. Mr. Mayor, members of the council, I think one point that's worth noting is, is a lot of these grants, the housing rehab, are <clears throat> they involve relatively small dollar figures. It could be a $10,000, renovation to someone's bathroom to make it ADA accessible, um, those kinds of things, which are very important for people and make a difference in people's lives. They're not an efficient way to spend grant funding. And so that's one of the challenges is that it's a great program for our community, but in terms of efficiency of staff time and effort to coordinate between you know, individual property owners to income certify them, to qualify the contractor, to facilitate the construction, it's it's hard. So that's the challenge, just to give you a flavor for kind of what the project program looks like. Any questions of uh, staff, Yvette? Um, so the item we're voting on today as an action item, I, I'm seeing that there's two, kind of two separate CBD grant excuse me, applications, is that what we're looking at? But we're voting on it as one item, is that correct? Correct, three, essentially. The Claire Street. The Claire's and then. Right, so it would be one application that comes from the city. You would have to adopt one resolution tonight if you wanted us to apply for one of those, but there's three distinct items that we would be applying, could, could be applying for. Okay, um, I do have some further questions about the Claire's Street. Um, options if we didn't move forward and I just don't know if that's a good time to talk about that now yeah um, so if we would if we did not move forward with um, the CDB G application process I would be interested in um, looking into other options for um, 
fixing the roads on Claire's and dealing with the traffic issues. One of the things that I saw on the campaign trail was a lot of folks talking about how it's really dangerous and cars are speeding down um, the road and that'd be something I would really be interested in prioritizing um, if we didn't move forward with this grant. I understand that it would take a lot of, you know, $5,000 is a lot of money to waste, but um, but maybe not. If I, And how many points do you say we missed it by? Like 120? We missed it by about 170, but the 125 we lost on the needs assessment was enough right there to keep right, us out. Right, right, okay. May I have a follow-up question? Uh, Steve, how much of the Clare Street project is actually funded? Right now, uh, I don't think there's any funding in there. There's None? maybe $10,000, less than $10,000 in there. Mm -hmm. You know, this to give you all a little history, this project was originally conceived um, back when we were talking about a hotel at the Riskman project. Right. And it was, its construction was a condition of that project. Um, and then it was when that hotel project went away, it was funded under the RDA, then the RDA went away and took the funding away from it. So it's been on the books for a while and um, it's a difficult one. Mm -hmm. um, we did have some funding put aside for it and then the county notified us that they were putting a sewer project in, so we kind of delayed it. Um, right now it's, it's, it's unfunded and, and clearly um, our, the city's priorities in, in available funding is going to be a stretch to try and find funding quickly for this project. All right, thank you. Yeah. Okay, with this, um, I'd like to concur. I've, I've known someone that's fixed the roof of a mobile home and it totally made a difference in their life. Um, visit the mobile home and it was night and day from a leaky roof. Um, at this point, I'd like to open to public comments on this issue. Um, seeing none, bring it back to the city uh, council for um, a motion or discussion. Yeah, I, you know, I'm extremely sensitive to Claire's, and, and Steve, you, you kind of developed that that process very well. Claire's has been a sad, sad story for all of us. I know I've met with a couple of homeowners over there. We all have, and we all recognize the improvements there. I, I've, I'm just not willing to, to, you know, frivolously throw away $5,000 when our chances are not very good of getting that. Um, the only thing I can offer in this, and the same thing I look at you is, and this is gonna be a tough decision for the council, is we have, you know, funding from uh, Measure D for roads, but we've pretty much got that calculated on 19 other projects throughout the city. So I don't think there's a miracle cure for Claire's, other than the fact that we all know that it needs it, but just the, 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 the dollar amount of it is just what makes it so overwhelming. and. The last time we had money like that was when we were spending Mesereau money for four years in a row. We had a million plus dollars and that money just isn't available to us these days. So with that, I'm gonna make a motion for staff recommendation to, I think it's not to apply in any of it this time. So that's my motion. May I ask one more question? Sure. Um, Katie, the future, uh, the grants that are gonna come up in the summer, will those, any of those be available for street repairs or it's always the same housing um would, would there would there be more or different types of grants available in the summertime um my understanding it would be the cbdg grants that just we the could same apply for yes. okay yeah. the same types yeah. thank you there's a motion on the floor is there a second second uh second by Kristen. so any more discussion sam um no, I, I, I support the motion. I was thinking maybe we should take the $5,000 that we just saved and put it into the Claire's project, but <laughs> it's a drop in the bucket, I know, but you know, maybe it's something moving in that direction, so. So, um, Kristen, you, you made the second. Do you have any comments? Okay. Yeah. So I, I had um, some thoughts, and I think I shared them with you, Steve. Um, so we had an initial design or concept for Claire's. Um, is there a way to do things, to revision it and accomplish some of the same things in terms of traffic calming? Um, one thing I noted in our discussion is that um, I think when this project first came up, there was a lot of vacant spaces on the streets. Um, people just did not need that parking space at all. Now it's it's, it's quite crowded. I, I think um, a lot of the um, units that border on 
Claire's and Wharf um, are now not just single families, but the families and their kids who also have cars. And you know, there's a big need for for people uh, to have places to park their cars. Um, that's just part of it. Um, so I'm just wondering if there's a way we could relook at this project. Not now. I'm not putting it into motion, but to say that maybe there's other ways to accomplish some of the same things without what we thought was quite a bit of money from the RDA, for instance. Certainly we can revision the project. Um, I think there's some items we could come up with. I mean, the, the key elements or important elements are slowing traffic down and providing safe pedestrian crossings. And, right. and those kind of come together because slow cars down, you narrow the road to make pedestrian crossings safer you narrow the you shorten the crossing so the two tie together <clears throat> there's you know potential to look at options to put in maybe something uh, smaller in scale or, or simpler in design at the intersections of 46 and 40 and 42nd and Claire's which is where we want to have the two pedestrian crossings mm -hmm. um, one of the big items that's driving up the cost now is that the road really needs to be repaved mm -hmm. um, so if we continue to defer that and, and but maybe concentrate on some of the uh, some pedestrian and, and traffic calming we, we may be able to do something and it'd be something we could you know talk about when we're putting the next year's budget and CIP program together okay so Claire's was not considered in terms of the uh, repaving that you envision for the whole city well the grant application included repaving the entire it, uh, so it's all I'm just saying we could potentially continue on trying to maintain it as it is and do other small scale improvements. To repave it is, is probably a million dollars just by itself. Just a okay. So what Ed said about uh, monies from D, um, these aren't going to get to this? Well, yeah, the council in the past has identified, has adopted a Measure D program for allocating the, a five year program. Mm -hmm. uh, Claire Street wasn't identified. Doesn't mean we can't come back next year and, and change that and put Claire Street on it and take something that's it's not cast in stone. What's cast in stone is the projects we've awarded already. So Measure D is paid for the Surrey City project we've already right. completed. <clears throat> right now, this year's funding is going toward the Brummer Street uh, project, which is underway as far mm -hmm. as design and, and outreach. Beyond that, um, I think next year is um, funding for paving at 46th. 42nd and Diamond area. Diamond area is yeah. tragically in Which needed. isn't yeah. just as much need of paving as anywhere else. So um, those are the ones I can remember off the top of my head where Measure D is allocated, There's, but we have allocated, like I said. We can come back, amend that, put Claire's in there, but there's no immediate funding available from that. Okay. And that's only $300,000 a year, just so we identify yeah, the value of it. Well, maybe it's good to have a second look because if it's true that the road is suffering quite a bit, then it's a major, you know, arterial. So we really, really do have to identify money to make that. Okay. So there's a second and uh, motion. So. Roll call. Yes. Councilmember Story. Aye. Councilmember Peterson. Aye. Councilmember Brooks. Aye. Councilmember Bator. Aye. And Mayor Bertrand. Aye. Thank you, Council. So on to item E, uh, options to streamline the meeting agenda, and there will be a staff report from the city manager. Mr. Mayor, members of the council, I think as it was pointed out by a member of the public that it is a little bit ironic that at the end of the night we're talking about streamlining the agenda. But nevertheless, <laughs> um, at our last council meeting, we had a conversation about what time the city council wanted to set as a regular meeting time. Um, it was noted that with the seven o'clock start, it becomes eight o'clock relatively quickly and nine o'clock, which can potentially dissuade some members of the public from participating. And so um, when we looked at the meeting time, we decided to stick with the seven o'clock meeting time, but the council directed me to work with the mayor to identify some mechanisms by which we could potentially get to the hearing portion of the agenda, which is usually why people will come to a public meeting uh, more quickly. <clears throat> um, so what we did was uh, the mayor and I went through the agenda and we took a look at some different opportunities and kind of highlighted some places we thought potentially the council could take a look at. And the reason why this is back on the agenda with the council is, is that at the end of the day, this is the city council's meeting. And I think 
really it's paramount, it's really important that everybody acknowledges what's in the agenda, that it's the right language that you all agree to it, and it's what you charge your mayor with, with um, enforcing and managing to. Um, so this was included in the packet. This is the, just a quick snapshot of a sample agenda. And what we did was in yellow, we highlighted some of the existing language, which is either practice that can help sometimes move meetings along um, that we may or may not be implementing today as a common practice. And then in green, we highlighted potentially some new language that could be added to our standard agenda format. The first was suggestions that the actual agenda be published that says that presentations are limited to eight minutes. Eight minutes is what we always tell a presenter whenever they're interacting with staff about how much time they have to make their presentation. Um, but I'll be honest, it's very common that the presentations go on for longer, significantly longer than eight minutes, um, particularly when they're not managed by city staff. So that is one opportunity to potentially identify a time limit actually in the agenda for the presentations rather than just a verbal conversation with the presenter offline. Mm -hmm. Uh, secondarily, we talk in the in the agenda about a maximum of 30 minutes for oral communications. I'll be honest with you, I can't think of very many times in my tenure here with the city where we have had more than 30 minutes of oral communications at the beginning of the agenda, um, but we just need to keep our eye on that when we do have a lot of public comment on off-agenda items and potentially look at limiting the public comment from three minutes down to two minutes just to keep that portion of the meeting moving. The next item we identified as a potential new item would be that we, there'd be a cap on the comment section at the beginning of the meeting. Um, you know, it's one of these funny things where individual council members or staff can make comments and individually no one talks for that long, but cumulatively if we all talk for five minutes before we get to the agenda, we've just burned through 40 minutes. Um, so one option would be that we identify in the agenda that the individual comments are intended to be two minutes or less. And then lastly, and this is a practice that we haven't followed very well, I would um, recently, is, is um, that when we pull items off consent, that particularly when they're pulled by council members, that we just agree that we'll defer those to the end of the evening um, and not delay the start of the public hearing process. Again, that's been part of our language in the agenda. And often we feel, I think, when, when they do get pulled that we can quickly address it and move on. But invariably it does. Um, it can be a death by a thousand cuts sometimes with this issue where it's a lot of little things that end up cumulatively pushing back the start of our public meeting. So these are the suggestions. Um, staff is available for questions or comments and in input from the council. Thank you, City Manager. Any questions of the City Manager? A question. Uh, yeah. Jamie, on the matter of the uh, council treasurer, well, we don't have a, well, <laughs> we'll see if we have a treasurer. Um, but, uh, and staff comments, uh, any reason those can't be moved to the end of the our uh, evening instead of up front? Uh, Council member story. So, you know, interestingly, about four years ago, I was working with the mayor. I don't remember who the mayor was at that time. We actually tried moving that to the end of the night. Um, but council members often have announcements that are sort of quick hitting items that they would like to put out there to the public when everybody is tuned in. And so we ended up with a council announcements at the beginning of the meeting and then council comments at the end of the evening. And we ended up, frankly, just double doing it. Mm -hmm. um, and at that point, the mayor and I, I don't remember who the mayor was at that point, but at that point we gave it a shot for four or five meetings and it was like, okay, that didn't work. And so we went back to it. So there's no reason we couldn't move them to the end of the night but I do think that there often is the desire by the council members and staff for that matter to, you know, announce the groundbreaking for the new library, for example, when, when everybody is tuned in. The trick is just keeping it to um, I understand. Yeah. I, I remember that. It did seem to lengthen things out quite a bit. Yeah. Did not work. Any other questions of staff? At this point, any questions from the public? Okay, your comments are over. Now let's go back to <laughs> Just quickly, it, it just occurs to me that why can't you move the public comments to the end? Yes, please respond. So, Mr. Mayor, members of the council, so that is, is an option to change the time of the public comments. Um, it is an option that's within the law. However, I think the optics of it in the community may not, um, it may be challenged optically. 
Thanks for pointing that out. Okay. Uh, any I, other? I also agree with your comment earlier that that is often not the the problem. <laughs> okay. That, that's not adding length to the agenda either. I thought I saw a hand raised. Yeah, please come to the mm -hmm. lectern. I just want to double check. You were talking about setting the meeting to six o'clock versus seven o'clock. That's what this would. We've decided that one. And that's already been decided. Yes. Okay. But to clarify, it wasn't decided to move it to six. We did not move it. We did not move it to six. We we had that discussion, the but not. The special meeting was going to be at oh, six. Okay. okay. It's a one time, when we have a special meeting one time only, it's at six, and that was, was decided. But we were gonna move our normal meetings, or we did not do that. Sure. Yeah, cool. that, that was last meeting. Yeah. Okay. Thank yeah. you. Okay. Thank you. So, uh, any more comments from the public? Uh, seeing none, bring it back to City Council uh, for discussion and direction. Um, I personally like the, all the suggestions that were made. I, I think that sometimes our presentations do get carried away, so I would have no problem limiting that. And I think that, um, I think it, you know, it's just a little bit of responsibility of us. You know, if we have something we need to say, I know we can, I think we can all get what we need to say in two minutes. I think that that's a, a reasonable amount of time to advertise. You know, if, you know, if I want to talk about the car show or, you know, the Easter egg hunt or anything, I think two minutes is a lot of time to, for us to talk. So. Um, I think I think everything that was mentioned, the city manager mentioned, I'm fine with. I I do think, as as the city clerk said, I don't think we have a problem here with uh, public comments to the point where I feel that moving it to end the meeting. I think sometimes people come here and they just want to say what's on their mind and then go home. So it would be counterproductive to tell them you have to wait till the end of the meeting to hear your public comments. So um, I think mostly it would just might fall on us a little bit how we move things along. The comments made about the consent calendar were good. So that's all I got. You bet? I have nothing. I can I make the motion? Sure. Make the motion to let me find the agenda item. It's the title to uh, consider options to streamline the meeting agenda. Okay, as presented by staff. Is there a second? Second. Okay. Kristen, do you have a comment? Uh, yeah, I just have a quick comment. I like everything that's um, in the recommendations. Um, that's the reason I seconded the motion. Um, it's also mentioned in here on direction if the uh, lighted timer should be used for our comments, our two-minute comments, correct? Or was it just for the eight-minute presentation? Staff was actually suggesting for the eight-minute presentation, I think getting in the business of putting the timer on council members. I'm, I'm certainly open to it if the council would like us to. Um, it, at your discretion, we were pro we were asking a question about the presentations more explicitly. Oh, okay. But Is that in, can I make a friendly amendment to include that in your motion? To put the council on timers? No, the oh. uh, <laughs> the presentations. Sorry, oh, eight okay. minute presentation. Okay. <laughs> can I make a friendly amendment to your motion for that? Yes, okay. Yes. Okay. <laughs> okay, Sam. <laughs> you're you're on a timer right now. So <laughs> okay, I guess I better talk fast. Um, <laughs> Please. <laughs> Um, well, uh, one, I guess I'm a little unclear of what the problem is or what the issue is and what we're trying to accomplish. But um, if it is getting to um, the public um, comments portions of our meeting and the public hearing uh, in our meeting, there may be a few other things that we could do. I mean, number one, um, we, we spend a little bit of time with a roll call and I've always wondered why we do that. Maybe it's required. but. It seems like that, um, you know, Linda could just recognize that the council are present and reflect that in a minute. So we're televised. Everybody can, who's in the room can see us. I'm not sure what the purpose of that is. Um, and so there's, there's a certain formality by it, but maybe we could look at that. Um, May I, um, I know there are other jurisdictions that do their roll call actually before closed session when there is closed session. Um, that, and that, uh, that yeah. also may. Yeah, well, I mean, that sounds like an excellent option. We could just, you know, maybe breeze through that just uh, with the Pl Pledge of Allegiance. Um, um, and then the other one, and when we get to the public hearings, I mean, it is also a matter of trying to move through those in uh, an efficient manner, but also uh, granting everyone an opportunity to speak. Um, I mean, I, and 
in my profession, it's always good to know what the other side has to say so you can kind of focus and narrow the issues. Um, and I was just going to suggest, well, maybe we should start the, with uh, public comments on the public hearing um, before we even have the staff uh, presentation um, so that we can s hear what the public's issues are. Um, that may, and if there are none, that may allow us to just speed through the staff explanation. We can not have council questions and we can just get right to, um, you know, either the action uh, at the time. Um, and, um, and also, and uh, I, you know, those discrete steps, um, staff explanation, council questions, public comment, Council deliberation and decision; those are, those to me s can take up quite a bit of time and aren't necessary for every particular issue. And and maybe the mayor could focus and try to streamline streamline those, um, and um, maybe on certain situations, council could forego their questions and. Um, the council deliberation and decision. I mean, it should be one step and or because we could just get right to the decision and not have two discrete steps. So I think those are just some thoughts about moving through the public hearing as quickly as possible so we don't lose pe people like Peter in the middle of the meetings. <laughs> and so, no, I didn't mean to draw attention <laughs> to you, Peter. But <laughs> uh, um, uh, and I, I think Th those are those are my thoughts, um, I'm, but I'm happy to support the motion as it stands. Okay, um, thank you for those thoughts. I, I do have a, a comment. I always wanted to get um, a presentation of the of the um, presentations ahead of time, so I had a sense of what they were. I could think about them, you know, instead of just being thrown at it for the first time. So I don't know if that's possible uh, to you know. If XYZ agency came to us and they're presenting something about their program. I'd kind of like to get that presentation ahead of time. I don't know if that's possible. It might help on the questions that we'd have. So that might move things forward. Just a suggestion. But I'm for the motion and um, I think um, by unanimous consent, we're all for this. Oh, make one, one oh, more. I'm one sorry. More I, I, Sam, I appreciate your comments and I think they're good. I especially like thinking about the roll call. I don't know why we do it and if we don't have to do it, then we shouldn't have to do it. If we can do it at closed session, I mean, if we just sometimes take away 30 seconds at a time, it'll seem that right. the pr priority of coming here, we were, it seemed like we weren't getting to the uh, public agenda till like 8 o'clock. And it right. just seems like we, we're trying to figure out why, how can we do this. And the other thing I just wanted to add was, you know, sometimes there's questions that we have that can be fielded to the city manager prior to coming to the council meeting. And I strongly suggest, you know, I mean, some things, you know, I don't, I don't necessarily want to do, I don't know if the public would be able to do their comments before hearing the staff presentation because sometimes the idea is the presentation will stimulate a question and that's, you know, what I think it is. But if you, if I have questions that I know are about the topic that are, aren't clear in the packet, you know, the phone call to either Steve or, or you know, can clear right. that up. So if we all just take the, 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 the initiative to do that, I, I think we all have the ability to streamline it, but I think the motion itself will, will at least make us focus on it. So, yes. Yeah. And listening to um, council people's uh, comments, I was pretty aware that there was a lot of questions of staff beforehand. I, I was pretty aware of that, so that probably helped. Okay, I know you did. That's for sure. <laughs> okay, um, so are we all in agreement to uh, pass this? No, you want to call for a vote? Okay, oh, I was say, trying to get around. Say all in favor? Okay, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay, there you go. Um, you know, the new city mayor will be better at this next time. How's that? Good. So we are now going to the um, redevelopment agency. Um, Do we need to adjourn this meeting first. Yes, you're right. Uh, this meeting adjourn, and we are now going to the. Um, City Capital as a successor agency to the former City Capital Redevelopment Agency. Um, well, let's forego the roll call because we're still here. Are there any additional materials to the? Um, none. None. Okay. Uh, public comments to the Redevelopment Agency successor agency meeting. I don't see any. Um, any staff comments? City Council comments? No, I don't see any. 
Okay, uh, we have a consent agenda here. Um, is there a motion to approve the, oh, excuse me, are there any items that people want to remove from the consent agenda? None. Is there a motion to approve the consent agenda? So moved. Second? Second. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Okay, general government uh, hearings. Uh, we now need to consider the approval of the ROPS, excuse me, the recognized obligation payment schedule for July 1st, 2019. Recommendation is to approve the recognized obligation. Is there a report on this? Mr. Mayor, members of the council, I, I will keep it relatively brief, and if any council member has any questions or wants any more detail, I'm happy to answer now or, or offline. But this is, the at this point, an annual process to basically approve the list of, for payment of former redevelopment agency obligations. Uh, the list originally was much larger. It's now been, most of those obligations have been paid off. And what we're down to is, is the housing rental assistance program, <clears throat> the Castle Mobile Home uh, Millennium Project, and then our administrative allowance. Uh, those are the three projects that we're requesting funding for. Uh, out of this ROPS, um, it'd be $145,000 total. Uh, with that, I would, I'm available for questions. Any questions of city manager? Seeing none. Oh, oh one question. Sorry. I, I just want to clarify. Uh, you've mentioned three, but I see five. Uh, Councilmember, Councilwoman Brooks. So, so the three projects that I think we're asking for funding on uh, is the housing, the housing authority program that we administer in um, the former rent control parks. Yep. One hundred thousand dollars for the Castle mobile home um, project, which was an acquisition partnership with a nonprofit that we we managed, and, and then our our thirty thousand dollars for the administrative allowance to sort of manage the redevelopment agency. There's a couple other. The Rispin Peary Park project is still listed as an obligation, but we're not requesting a draw on it at this time. Thank you. Any other questions of staff? I had Sam. one. Um, Jamie, on the payment register, um, the, under status, um, the, the three of the items are just identified as open. I just, what does that mean? So I, I, <laughs> I actually talked with Mark Sullivan quite a bit about this today. The Rispin Peary Park, for example, we listed it with the zero obligation, but it's still listed there. Uh -huh. And you know what that, there's a, a long story around that project and it had to do with making ADA repairs to the park due to a lawsuit and the redevelopment agency owned the property at the time so it was a jointly funded project not all the work has been done and it's going to get completed with the Rispin project and so even though we think it's fully paid out we're still continuing to list it to kind of keep that door open okay just not uh, not finalized items then and because once it's gone it's gone and you yeah. can't get it back on the ROPS right okay, okay. thank you no more questions. Is there a motion to approve? I vote to approve. Second. Okay. I'm sorry. Um, any comments from the public on this? My, sorry. Okay. There's a second motion. All those in favor? Aye. We have Aye. Any opposition? Did we have a motion? Yes. Yes. And okay. Second. My apologies. Sorry. Okay. So all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any approve? Uh, disapprove? None. Okay. So it passes by zero. So with that, this. Um, Meeting is adjourned. Well done. It'll get better.